Who would win in a fight between Sonic the Hedgehog and Fox McCloud? I'm Mink and this is Smash Bracket, the show where we put every character from Super Smash Bros Ultimate into a giant animated fighting tournament to figure out who's canonically the strongest. This episode is the second in a line of remakes of our earliest episodes, with updated research and new animation. We heard your concerns last time, so this time around we've reevaluated everything from the ground up. This time we're really going to get into the nitty gritty details and finally find out once and for all who would really win between Sonic the Hedgehog and Fox McCloud. And to start things off, we're going to talk about the most famous hedgehog of all and dive into the Sonicverse. Sega. All right, let's run this one more time. My name is Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm the fastest thing alive, and for years, I've been the one and only Blue Blur. I'm pretty sure you know the rest. I saved a bunch of people, kicked some baldy butt, saved the world, and then I saved the world again, and again, and again, and again. And I, uh, did this. We don't really talk about that one. Look, I'm a comic book, I'm a serial, a Christmas special, I have an excellent theme song, and a so-so popsicle. I mean, I've looked worse. But after everything, I still love being me. I mean, <laughs> who wouldn't? So no matter how many hits I take, I always find a way to come back. Because the only thing standing between my world and Oblivion is me. There's only one Sonic the Hedgehog, and you're looking at him. Sonic has had a long history with countless games and abilities to go through, but behind them all is a drive to go fast, live free, and do what's right, while facing off against evil with ruthless, emotionally devastating burns. Hey! I've been looking for you, Baldy McNose Hair! Who are your friends? Brutal. But quips aside, he especially has a passion for protecting nature and life forms who can't help themselves, and he often frees small animals inside robots he destroys. My favorite display of this kindness is in the Chow Garden from Sonic Adventure 2, which honestly has probably taken up hundreds of hours over my life. Anyway, he raises these little guys, puts them through kindergarten, and buys them food on the black market. You know, good parent stuff. But it turns out that they aren't just cute pets. The Chow that he bonds with have been known to fight by his side or grant him special abilities like reviving him after a lethal blow. You know, I wonder if the Sonic Chows feel bad that he didn't choose to take them over the other Chows when they went so hard into that branding. But even though Sonic has a softer side, he isn't afraid to take a stand and do what's right by zooming around with his signature super speed. While Sonic normally travels somewhere between one and three times the speed of sound, there have been moments where he really lets loose and gives it all he has. An impressive display is here, where he rammed through chaos at over 300 times the speed of sound, but the most impressive feat comes from being able to outrace the Wisps. For context, Wisps are small alien creatures that were kidnapped and enslaved by Dr. Eggman to assist in his evil plans. Not only are they the cutest little things ever, but when Sonic saved them, they granted him powerful abilities. Things like turning Sonic into a high-speed energy beam, or a pseudo-black hole that sucks in everything around him, or an asteroid with a similar effect. Or most dangerously of all, it can turn him into a drill. You know, uh, I, I feel like maybe these weren't all created equal. Anyway, Sonic has shown himself to be faster than these little guys, which is saying something since even the most basic wisps were able to fly out of the atmosphere in just a few seconds. By using the space elevator they reach for reference and estimating its distance from Earth, we can calculate that they would have had to be flying nearly 23,000 times the speed of sound, or 2% the speed of light. Sonic is able to use this speed to back up his signature strategy, which I like to call taunt and roll. Sonic loves to get under the skin of his opponents, and he uses it as an opportunity to bash into them at full speed. And if that bashing doesn't work, he tries it again and again and again and again until he can get better results. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because this works a surprising amount of time, given that Sonic is strong enough to blast himself through this robot, and he's durable enough to tank being launched into this condensed planet hard enough to make it quake. He also has a decent amount of hand-to-hand -hand fighting experience, as we can see in Sonic Battle, Sonic Frontiers, and the best game of all, Sonic the Fighters. Heck yeah. 
If he still can't come out on top, though, he's got plenty of options to tip things in his favor. Thanks to his handy-dandy magical briefcase, yes, really, Sonic can carry those wisps that we mentioned earlier, as well as plenty of power-ups to use at his discretion. He's got shields to protect him from attacks, both purely physical and elemental, gems that allow him to slow time to increase his own speed or shrink down to minuscule sizes, and several other speed-enhancing items. And when that speed is applied to something like ramming into an enemy at max speed, a homing attack at these speeds is like detonating 50 atomic warheads on his opponent with every strike. You know, I say this pretty often, but I especially mean it with Sonic. If I were to go through every single item and ability that Sonic has had over the years, we would be here for hours. So unless you want me to sit here and go through a detailed account of Sonic's miniature otters, I think it's best that we stick to the most important stuff. Because when you've been around for as long as Sonic, you end up with an arsenal so huge that you get things as mundane as glue to stick your enemies into place, or magic gloves that turn his opponents into little bubbles or something. You know, I, I can't figure out what's happening here. The robot explodes, and then it's in the bubble, non-exploded. Uh, I think maybe it's its soul. Uh, I'm not going to think about it. And no need to think about it when he also has powers that cause nearby machines to implode. But the most common thing that Sonic collects are rings. You know, rings are actually pretty easy to pass over, since in-game they're just a collectible that you lose when you get hit. But they actually lend Sonic some legitimate survivability. You know, uh, in retrospect, this makes me really wish that I didn't spend 10,000 rings on the Chow Black Market to have Amo Chow narrate the game. Uh, but what's done is done. In Sonic Prime, we even see Sonic mention how the benefits granted by even just a few dozen of these were enough to make him feel safer in a fight. They act as sort of an extra health bar for Sonic, as the rings absorb damage that would normally be applied to Sonic himself, substituting as a target for his enemies, even taking on non-traditional damage like standing in lava. As long as Sonic has even one ring, he's able to survive just about any attack that's thrown at him. And while in combat, Sonic normally carries a maximum of 999 rings, in Sonic 06, we can see that he's capable of carrying nearly 10 million rings. Which is just... that's just too many rings, man. Given that each ring is about half the length of Sonic, if you line them all up end to end, it would be long enough to wrap a chain around the entire United States a thousand times over. Sonic's overwhelming wealth aside, his ring count in combat is especially meaningful when you realize that he only loses 10 rings when he's hit in some games. So if we assume that those 10 rings are what's required to reach what would otherwise be his maximum durability, this would mean that a full count of rings would essentially serve as a ridiculously huge, powerful damage buffer. But that said, a strong enough attack could still blow through them in a single hit. Getting rid of his rings isn't as simple of a task as it would sound though, since Sonic can create his own rings just by running. But even if his rings were totally taken out of the equation, Sonic still wouldn't be easy to put down. He's had a variety of items that can bring him back from death several times over. But more than that, Sonic has access to a soul gauge that can also tank attacks for him before allowing him to die. And just like rings, this can also be refilled just by running. What I'm getting at is that Sonic is really, 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 really hard to kill, as I'm sure Dr. Eggman could tell you. Whether it's through revive items, rings, or abilities like parrying incoming attacks, Sonic is just hard to put down. Even more so when we look into his powerful abilities that come from the seven Chaos Emeralds. These gems awaken new abilities with him, whether it's letting him stop time, or his most notable power, giving him access to ultra-powerful super forms. Super Sonic is the most famous of these, dramatically improving Sonic's durability through sheer chaos power, to the point that he could slam through this planet and withstand its explosion basically unharmed. And he can also turn this same energy back on his enemy with a variety of powerful attacks and blasts. More than that though, it also boosts up his speed to around 39% the speed of light, while still maintaining access to all of his previous speed enhancing abilities as before, as well as combat oriented ones like reflecting projectiles with a swipe of his hand. But, as some Dragon Ball Z characters would say, this isn't even his final form. When the Emeralds are fully upgraded, Sonic gains access to Hypersonic, who's basically Supersonic with an extra helping of Chaos Power. While the exact stat increase of his form is a little unclear, it grants Sonic extra abilities, like a flash that wipes out all enemies from the area. And while these Chaos Emeralds are incredibly powerful, they aren't without their weaknesses. Maintaining Sonic super forms requires a large amount of rings, and so they're on an inherent time limit. But even so, these forms aren't totally invincible. They take about half a second to activate while swirling around Sonic, so it's not exactly instant, and they've also been shown to break from strong enough attacks. But even so, Sonic's transformations don't end with the Super and Hypersonic forms. 
years. He also has had access to a bunch of different transformations over the years, ranging anywhere from a Werehog to a powerful Excalibur form that doesn't even require Chaos Emeralds to activate. Instead, opting for the Sword Calibur, which when upgraded by three Holy Swords, becomes the legendary blade Excalibur, which turns Sonic into a golden-clad Magic Knight. Uh, you know, I can't tell if this looks awesome or stupid, but I, I think it might be both. All of these come together to make a nigh-unstoppable blue blur. Even when existence as we know it was threatened by deadly enemies like Solaris and Time Eater, Sonic was there to stop them. And even though many of his more threatening enemies, like the ones I just mentioned, don't show us on-screen feats of what they're fully capable of, Sonic has gone up against world-threatening enemies time and time again, with pure bravery, a dash of humor, and a desire to protect those in need. In the Lilat system, stories have been told for decades about a legendary mercenary who roamed the galaxy to protect those in danger and guard the universe from destruction, with little thought to their own personal gain. This person was said to be the best of the best, the kind of fighter who made villains tremble just by hearing his name. This was Fox McCloud. All right, boys, let's rock and roll! As a child, Fox wanted nothing more than to be just like his father, James, who was the head of an elite mercenary team called Star Fox. But one day, after an investigation into bioweapons went south, James lost his life in a battlefield. This just goes to show you that if a guy like this asks you to go on an investigation for a dangerous bioweapon, far out of the reach where anyone could hear you scream, just say no. The accident not only killed James, but it also ripped a black hole in space that swallowed up an entire meteor field. With the singularity threatening Lilat, and Star Fox no longer in the picture to protect it, the way was cleared for an evil scientist named Andros to launch war against the solar system. But Fox McCloud wouldn't let him go unchallenged. Unfortunately for Andros, he had just made an enemy out of someone who wasn't only an expert combatant and a world-class pilot trained by the Cornarian military, but he could also recite the Constitution backwards and belch on command. Andros should have been shaking in his boots. While burping your way through the Constitution is certainly impressive, what's almost as dangerous is Fox's mastery of combat. In his training, he learned how to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat and used several weapons to proficiency, such as guns, swords, and a staff. He was so capable that not only could he hold his own in a trial of the gods to test his combat skill with the staff, but the staff was also capable of shooting fire, ice, creating earthquakes, and making Fox completely intangible while holding still. Fox was skilled enough to utilize each and every one of these abilities in a fluid stream of combat, even being able to fight through horrific hallucinations that manifested Fox's deepest fear, which I, uh, I, I guess was raptors that could turn invisible. That's so oddly specific. But Fox was going to need more than just his own skill to defeat Andros, so he recruited three other team members to reform Star Fox and lead them to victory. Each of these pilots brought a new set of skills to the team. Slippy was an ace mechanic and weapons expert. Thanks to his talents, Fox was also able to use a huge variety of weaponry that Slippy and his father helped develop. Missile launchers, Gatling guns, sniper rifles, grenades, cluster bombs, and his most powerful weapons of all, the Demon Sniper, Demon Launcher, and the Fireburst Pod. Each of these is able to take down an R-Wing in a single shot, but even his most basic weapon was deadly, his Laser Blaster. Similar models to Fox's were able to completely vaporize carbon copies of Andros while Fox and his crew were adventuring as a group of ragtag pirates. Long story. Anyway, to vaporize something of this size, it would require the energy of nearly 5 tons of TNT, which is packing a heck of a punch for something so easy to fire. And Fox can mix these in with utility items like invisibility, jetpacks, and uh, turning into a dinosaur. Which Slippy really just threw together in a few seconds and then airdropped it to Fox's watch while he was in prison. But dinosaur powers and base weaponry aside, the team also developed dangerous items to use in their training together. Things like invisibility cloaks or transposers that swap the pilot's positions with their enemies to set up trick shots, or dead weights which completely bring things that they touch to a halt, or the firebird which engulfs the ship in flames and instantly kills anything near it. Thanks to Slippy, Starfax had a solid foundation to take on anyone that they need to. Which brings us to our next pilot. Falco Lombardi. He was one of the few flyers in the galaxy that could give Fox a run for his money in a dogfight, being just as good if not better than him. Between their combined skill, the Star Fox team was able to push their flying skills to a whole new level. More than anyone else, Falco was willing to go for maneuvers that other pilots would be way too scared to even attempt. Things like flying into his own attacks to launch them at even higher speeds. Which is really saying something because these ships are fast. 
In Star Fox 2, they were able to traverse the entire Lila system in a matter of minutes, which would require a travel speed of nearly 190,000 times the speed of light, before even accounting for the various methods of increasing the ship's speed, which would bring them up to over 670,000 times the speed of light for travel. This was no sweat for the R-Wing in their corridor mode, a form of the ship that allows them to fly at full speeds in a relatively straight line. But in order to have combat maneuvering, they needed to activate all range mode, which still was able to travel at speeds of nearly 40 times the speed of light after modifiers are applied. That said, having dogfights at hyperluminal speeds like these means that every single turn in combat would be taking them over hundreds of thousands of miles making this max speed a little unwieldy in a fight. That doesn't decrease their overall travel speed, I mean, they were still fast enough to outrun a massive planet exploding, turning what would have been lethal damage into barely enough energy to wipe out a fifth of San Francisco by the time it caught them. That is not what I would have expected from a planet exploding, but they got really far away from the center of the explosion before it caught them. But despite these massive travel speeds, Falco and Fox also showed us what R-Wings are capable of in very tight quarters. In the comic with a very strange name, Farewell Beloved Falco, Fox and Falco get into a dogfight to see which of them is the better fighter. Near the end of the fight, Fox drops this, which appears to be a variant of the light torpedo used in the Star Fox submarines. By the time it took the explosion to fully form and expand, Fox and Falco were able to have a battle pulling out all the stops that they had. So how fast was this? When comparing the rate of this explosion to what we see from the light torpedoes in Star Fox 64 and accounting for speed modifiers, Fox and Falco and their R-Wings would be capable of maneuvering at 2,090 times the speed of sound. And we can also see Fox and Falco themselves maneuvering at incredible speeds here. By looking at the speed, Falco would have to move here to bring his arm up to his face and then back to his steering mechanism before his ship passes through the explosion. He'd have to be moving nearly 46 times the speed of sound, which honestly sounds like a bit of overkill for Fox needing to dodge dinosaurs in his very next adventure. Velociraptor, more like Velocity Raptor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a work in progress. But over the years, this rivalry between Fox and Falco only grew more intense as the team obtained newer and newer ships. Things like the Black R-Wing, which increased their power threefold, or the Light R-Wing, which doubles their speed while the Armored R-Wing doubles their defense. The R-Wings also possessed the ability to reflect projectiles with their signature barrel rolls. And later, they obtained a reflector shield to launch attacks back at their opponents for up to 15 times damage with every reflection. These were all possible thanks to their signature G-Diffusers. G-Diffusers are the lifeblood of the R-Wing and allows them to instantly accelerate and decelerate while also shrugging off devastating attacks. And although it is weak to sustain damage over time or many weaker attacks, it is really, really good at shrugging off one attack at a time. But no ships were more dangerous than the ones the team obtained in Starlink during the battle for Atlas. When meeting with space adventurers in another part of the galaxy, Star Fox gained the ability to fully customize their ships on the fly with all sorts of new weapons. Time stops, temperatures approaching nearly absolute zero, or temperatures that are hot enough to melt steel, speed sapping vortexes, or the ability to turn their ships into battering rams to add elemental damage on top of its physical power. And these can all be significantly upgraded with special armor and weapon upgrades that can be switched between instantly at will. And these can also provide some serious benefits, like automatically reflecting projectiles, permanent invisibility, when not attacking, and immunity to all status effects in the game, or inflicting freezing damage or time stops on anyone who touches them or drops them beneath 30% health. But even if they were destroyed, that wouldn't be as big of a problem as you would think, as the ships can instantly rebuild themselves into another ship to keep on fighting, and it can do this over a dozen times before being out of commission. When using these ships, Fox also gained access to a special summoning ability called Rock and Roll, with which he calls an ally in for a short amount of time to assist in combat. Anyway, point being that these ships are an incredible threat to anyone that they face. Which brings us to our final core member of the team, Peppy Hare. Peppy was on the original Star Fox team with James McCloud and has far more experience than anyone else in the crew. He led the team to victory time after time and became a mentor figure to Fox. With his expertise, the team learned how to use their pre-existing abilities in new and lethal ways. For example, the team developed a signature final attack that nobody would ever think of doing for some reason. Fly your ship into something at maximum speed. Which, honestly, if done at maximum speeds, is incredibly damaging. And that damage can be boosted even higher with custom armor and Starlink. 
making its output equal to 2.48 zettajoules per centimeter squared. That would be like hitting you with a bullet with the force of 38 million nuclear warheads behind it. In their all range mode, they can even fly into meteors at their maximum speed for a durability equal to 866 megatons of TNT per centimeter squared. And that's before even applying durability modifiers. Peppy's guidance mixed with Fox's own strategy allowed Star Fox to take on universe threatening foes. It probably helps that 90% of the time, the best strategy is shoot the glowing things that come out and circle around the boss as fast as you can. But I mean, no need to look at gift alien in the mouth. Together, the Star Fox team fought through thick and thin, defending the solar system and eventually taking down Andross and avenging his father's death. But there was still one force that he was never able to beat. The 80-year mortgage that Fox inherited from his dead father for the Great Fox. Holy crap, that puts Tom Nook to shame. But anyway, despite the losses that shaped his early life, he was finally able to beat the odds and show that he really was the best of the best. But that didn't last long. A few years later, he'd be forced to fight battles against beings capable enough to rip apart planets. And along the way, he met the final permanent member of Star Fox, Crystal. Fox and Crystal instantly fell in love at first sight, which you can tell from the romantic saxophone music that comes out of nowhere when Fox lays eyes on her. Wow, she's beautiful. Fox vanquished the threat on her planet and won her affection. And he was able to do this thanks in part to creatures called Baffum Dads, which can revive Fox after a lethal blow nine times in a row. During this adventure, Fox had pretty much run out of money, and his group's equipment was at an all-time low. But the R-Wing still packed a serious punch. In a single shot, it could vaporize an entire meteor. And with a smart bomb, it could do the same thing to 23 meteors, which is doubly impressive when you realize that Fox himself is able to tank these same smart bombs with almost no issue which would require enough durability to withstand over five atomic warheads hitting him head on. But the peace after this battle didn't last long, and soon the galaxy was under attack by another alien species called Aperoids that posed a threat to the entire universe. There were more stakes than there had ever been, and in this fight, Fox pulled out all the stops to save the day. But he lost many friends along the way, and was even forced to shoot down his own commander before wiping out the species and winning the war. This left Fox emotionally traumatized. He lost his father, he was forced to shoot down a lifelong friend, and he led his teams into a battle that nearly cost them their lives. This took a serious toll on the team, causing each of the members to leave Star Fox for good. And when the universe came under threat a few years later, Fox was at an all-time low. He pushed away the only woman he'd ever loved, cut off ties with his best friends, and almost certainly never paid off the 80-year mortgage. He, uh, he was not in a good place here. But in spite of the depression, he managed to pull himself together just enough to save the universe one last time. And in the battle to do so, he managed to reforge his old friendships and reconnect with Crystal. And he even went on to start a family with her. Fox's story is one of perseverance through devastating loss and grief that nearly cost him everything that he loved. But through it all, whenever danger showed its face, Fox would still be there to defend those who relied on him with a skill and professionalism that was nearly unrivaled by all. And he did this by relying on his friends, trusting his instincts, and never giving up. All right, now that our fighters are set, I want to take a quick minute to tell you about a way that you can seriously step up your video editing skills. I know many of you either create your own videos or want to create your own videos, and that's why we partnered up with Mr. Horse's Animation Composer and Premiere Composer. I seriously use these all the time, and it saves me literal hours. Let's say I wanted to show something like, I don't know, Waluigi pops on the screen, jiggles like jello, and then shrinks out of frame. Normally, I'd have to do this step by step, keyframing every single part along the way, but with Animation Composer, I just need a couple clicks and it's done. It's also got text pop-ups, backgrounds, transitions, special effects, hand-drawn effects, and even a fully customizable sound effect library. If you want to step up your editing to the next level, I seriously, seriously cannot recommend this enough. If you want to check it out and toss some money toward the channel as well by doing so, the link is in the description and I would really appreciate it. But with that out of the way, let's get into the fight to find out who will advance on to the next round of the Smash Bracket and who will be eliminated. Gotcha. We 
You were right. The thief was too fast to hit. Nice job, McCloud. Hey, don't forget who kicked your butt on Titania. You know, if you wanted a good shot of me, you could have just asked. Oh, yeah? I'll put it in your obituary. Unless you hand over those gems you stole, then you can run back home. Bees? Thanks for gathering the others for me, but I'll be taking them back now. These aren't toys. There's more worlds at stake here than you could possibly imagine. Ugh, saving the universe? Is it Tuesday already? I saved the universe in my sleep. I'm taking those emeralds. Can't let you do that, hedgehog. Rock and roll, boys! Destroy that space elevator! He's not getting away again! You got it, Fox! We've got this one, Starbuck! That'll be harder than you think. Oh, great! Looks like we've got company! I'll take care of this one! Everything you've got. Let's do this. I guess you were fast enough to eat my dust after all. Now, time to track down those shards. After 10,000 years, it is finally done! Oh my gosh, okay, not 10,000 years, but this has been going on a long time. And I know that there's a lot of people who thought that this would be a massively easy win for Sonic. 
but to be honest, he narrowly takes this win here, and there's a lot of complex interactions to find a victor. For example, if you look at the stat breakdown, you can see that Fox had a slight advantage. He has more edges and stats than Sonic. Yet we also immediately run into one of the biggest complications for this match. Each character has two pretty distinct forms that they can fight in. For example, Sonic has Super Sonic, or his other transformations, and Fox has the R-Wing, or his other ships. And these forms have drastically different stats, so rather than being able to compare the stats directly like we do in most fights, this match is almost like a tag team where the fighters can swap out with a partner. In order to get a grasp on how this fight would play, we need to look at each individual possibility and figure out how each scenario would go. For each little sub-fight, I'm going to break down the stats of each related fighter so we can see what their strategies look like and how it influences the fight overall. First up is Base Sonic vs Fox outside of his ship. At this point, Sonic can both one-shot Fox and massively outspeed him. That said, Fox would only need to shoot him one time with one of his one-shot weapons in order to burn through all of his rings, but any of his other weapons are going to barely even tickle Sonic. Now, Fox does have ways to avoid danger here, like the intangibility from his staff or invisibility from his cloaking device, which he's likely to take advantage of to summon an R-Wing. But even if Fox were to line up a clean shot, he isn't likely to let things get to that point without calling in his R-Wing, where he's by far the most comfortable. And when that's mixed with Sonic's general hesitation to kill his opponents, and Fox's several revives, it's pretty likely that Base Sonic vs Fox on the ground is always going to convert into Base Sonic vs Fox in his ship. Especially because if Sonic doesn't feel threatened by Fox, he's not likely to turn into Super Sonic. The next scenario to mention is Super Sonic vs Fox outside of his R-Wing. Now this scenario is very, very unlikely to occur. Like I said, Sonic would have no reason to transform against a grounded Fox, and Fox is most likely to destroy the Emeralds while Sonic is trying to transform. He's not exactly subtle or quick with how he does this. But if Fox does fight Super Sonic, his only hope is to call in an R-Wing, which would be possible because it can form around him, but extremely difficult. And even if he was pulling his punches, it would be pretty hard for Sonic to avoid killing Fox here. Which means that Sonic probably wants to avoid this situation as well, as he generally doesn't like to kill unless he's forced to. So next up we have Super Sonic vs the R-Wing. And this situation is also fairly unlikely to occur. For that reason that I mentioned earlier, Fox is very experienced at shooting down glowing artifacts that pop up and circle enemies to make them stronger or attack him. So with his speed, he's fairly likely to be able to get that off. But let's say that he could transform here. This is actually a pretty bad situation for Super Sonic. While Sonic can one-shot the R-Wing and is durable enough to tank most attacks from it, when he turns into Super Sonic, he's also giving up a huge amount of versatility for raw power. In this form, Sonic is even more of a straightforward fighter than he usually is. He almost exclusively rams headfirst into his enemies over and over and over, and this would be a very bad idea. Fox's ships can automatically apply status effects like time stops or freezing to Sonic on contact. Fox could also activate the Firebird, which would instantly kill Sonic when he's within 30 feet of the ship regardless of his durability. And even if Sonic could destroy the R-Wing here, Fox has 13 ships that are almost identical in strength and would instantly replace themselves as they're destroyed. When this dynamic is combined with the fact that a rolling attack would be way stronger than anything Super Sonic has ever endured, when done at its maximum speed of course, this is a super tough matchup for Super Sonic. That said, Sonic does have the advantage that a single rolling attack would be a huge commitment since it would take him across the entire solar system, but when all of these things that I mentioned are combined with Fox's ability to stop time and his own immunity to time stops, things just become much more likely that Super Sonic bashes into the R-Wing over and over and then accidentally takes himself out of the fight. So the last scenario comes down to base Sonic versus Fox in the R-Wing. And this is surprisingly not only the scenario that's most likely with this fight, but it's also where Sonic stands the best chance. Surprisingly, base Sonic has a much better chance to take out an R-Wing than Super Sonic. Or more accurately, he has enough of an arsenal to be safe from doing so from a distance in a way that prevents Fox from continuing on with his huge arsenal of ships. The R-Wing is too durable for Sonic to meaningfully deal damage to it over and over. And while without rings, the R-Wing would be strong enough to obliterate Sonic with even just a normal hyper laser, Sonic's rings would make him durable enough to survive around 40,000 shots. This means that Fox's only realistic win options here are the same as Super Sonic, using the Firebird or the Rolling Attack. Yet, there's some important differences in this fight than the Super Sonic fight that makes this much harder on Fox. First off, Sonic is going to be taking damage from anything that Fox does. 
but it's not going to be meaningful due to the rings, and so Fox would have no method of determining that before he attacks at least one or two times. But he's also not likely to keep up a useless strategy after Sonic endures a couple of hits, and so this key time in between his first few attacks and when he starts to adapt is absolutely vital for base Sonic, and he can execute on it far more effectively than Super Sonic. While Super Sonic is most comfortable in the air, base Sonic is far more comfortable on the ground, meaning that Fox's rolling attack is going to be really hard for him to use, since he has a very narrow angle of attack that would work without slamming through the planet that they're able to fight on, and even if the R-Wing could endure that, from a moral standpoint, Fox isn't likely to do that unless he literally has no other option. So while Super Sonic and Sonic in his base form are both likely to default to ramming attacks, unlike Super Sonic, Base Sonic has other options that he can use to fight without making direct contact. And while touching the R-Wing is still extremely dangerous for Sonic, and due to the fact that Fox doesn't know how many rings he has to burn through in order to do significant damage, he's unlikely to catch on super quickly that his base lasers aren't as effective as he thinks they are. With his experience, he'd probably just think of it as whittling down a health bar. But Fox isn't stupid enough to keep wasting his opportunities. He has a few ways to trap Sonic in time or sap away his speed, but Sonic just has so many ways he can deal with the R-Wing. For example, he can use the Jade Wisp and phase through the R-Wing, grabbing Fox out of his ship, which is probably the most likely outcome here, as it allows a chance for a non-lethal victory, and it would, probably unknowingly to Sonic, get around all of these instant death methods that would happen from touching the R-Wing especially things like the Firebird. But should he decide that he does need to finish things lethally, which again, he's not super likely to do, he could use things like the Violet Wisp or Ring Time or Detonate, any of which would instantly destroy the R-Wing, and the first two would probably take Fox along with it. Now, this doesn't mean that the R-Wing doesn't have some significant advantages here. For example, it can turn invisible for up to four minutes. And Sonic honestly doesn't have a great way to deal with this, but for the same reasons that I mentioned earlier, Fox is likely to waste his first few opening shots on his standard arsenal. Meaning that even if he can't see the R-Wing, seeing that these lasers are being blasted from a very specific place gives Sonic that prime window between the first few attacks from the R-Wing and when Fox starts to adapt. Given his superior speed and ways that he can enhance his thinking time, this small period is likely going to be all he needs for Sonic to figure out how to destroy the R-Wing. Overall, this fight is incredibly close. Star Fox as a series isn't talked about super often within the Versus community, but it's a serious threat and Sonic narrowly took the win here. In the end, Fox is a better strategist, and against a slower opponent, he'd be able to end the fight instantly. But between Sonic's speed and his rings keeping him in the game, like I said, he has that prime window to adapt and take Fox out of the fight, along with his high maneuverability that would make it hard for Fox to land his most lethal attack, the rolling attack. But at the end of the day, the blue blur's versatility is just too much for Fox to reliably deal with. Sonic is the winner, and will be moving on to the next round of the Smash Bracket. Next time on the Smash Bracket. Alright buddy, let's get you back to your friends. Good boy. This is gonna take a while. We need your help. <laughs> 